Hello and welcome to The Arise interview where we take time to reflect on the big stories from the news and on the fortunes and affairs of the world in an hour of conversation with commentators, analysts and thought leaders. I'm Charles Anyagolu. Coming up in the next 60 minutes, we meet one of the most high profile and outstanding investment bankers in Nigeria, Yoande Sadiku, Executive Secretary and CEO of the Nigerian Investment Promotion Commission. For many years, she was the head of investment banking at Stanbic IBTC Bank PLC, but she became even more famous when she took on the role of executive producer of the movie adaptation of Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie's award-winning novel, Half of a Yellow Sun, raising $10 million to turn the book into a film. And now, as head of the Nigerian Investment Promotion Commission, she has another monumentally daunting challenge, attracting investment to Nigeria. Yewande Sadiku, one of a kind, coming up. My guest today, Yewande Sadiku, has put her name in the history books. Nigeria is no stranger to filmmaking, but Miss Sadiku wasn't drawn to the usual quick-fire movie. She wanted to do something that would rank with the best of them in the film world, to participate in a global movie space in which Nigerians would be actively involved. And so she took up the challenge, becoming the creative force and executive producer behind the screen adaptation of the best-selling novel by Chimamande Ngozi Adichie, Half of a Yellow Sun. It tells the story of two sisters during the Biafran War in 1960s Nigeria and was directed by the Nigerian playwright B.E. Bandele with the British-Nigerian actor Chiwetel Ejiofor starring alongside the British Zimbabwean actress Tandy Newton. But of course, the movie would not have been made if it wasn't for the executive producer, my guest today, Yewande Sadiku, who raised all of $10 million for the production. Well, in a moment, we'll speak to Miss Sadiku and attempt to find out more about how it all came together. But first, here's a short trailer of that epic movie adaptation of Half of a Yellow Sun. Happy Independence. Thank you. I just don't get what you see in these English boys. <laughs> I applied for a job as a lecturer in the Department of Sociology and I got it. A special woman is arriving this weekend. Very special. Yes, sir. My name is not Sir. Yes, sir. My sister's revolutionary lover and his band of drinkers. He did not tell us you were logically beautiful. I'll take that as a compliment. Let's get married. It's happened. There's been a coup. Right. What's happening in Lagos? This is the beginning. The stage is a little longer. <laughs> he doesn't deserve you, you know. Leave my son alone and tell your fellow witches you did not see him. The only authentic identity for an African is his tribe. I am a Nigerian because the white man gave me that identity. Get out. It meant nothing. Stay away from my house. You want your passport? Where are you running to? Mama, people are fleeing. We're at war. I feel as if I have been dropped into something that I don't entirely understand. You must never behave as if your life belongs to a man. Oh, God. Our relationship is the most important thing to me. We have to make the right decision for us. Absolutely brilliant to see snippets of that movie again. And I am absolutely thrilled to bits to say that the brilliant Yoande Sadiku, executive producer of Half of a Yellow Sun and current executive secretary and CEO of the Nigerian Investment Promotion Commission, joins me now in the studio. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you very much for having me. I mean, you are a ferociously busy person, aren't you? <laughs> 
occupational hazard. <laughs> I can imagine. But then you thrive on things like that, don't you? Yes, I, I guess I do. I enjoy it, the thrill of it. If that adrenaline isn't rushing, then life becomes a bit of a... I exactly. mean, obviously, there are a lot of other things. You have your family and so on. But in terms of work, it becomes a bit of a drag, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. But even in life, I get ad adrenaline from many sources. L such as? Um, I've climbed Kilimanjaro. Really? Yes, I have. That's extraordinary. I didn't get to the highest point. I stopped at the second highest point, Stella's Point. I died the Great Barrier Reef. My goodness. I've walked the Camino de Santiago. I've jumped out of perfectly good planes. Just <laughs> hey, you know, what's happening? I'll leap out of the skydiving, plane. Skydiving. So. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. But you decided to boldly go where no Nigerian investment banker had gone before, movie making. So quite a big trek from investment banking. I mean, an investment banker used to bricks and mortar, which is pretty much the way that it works in Nigeria, to executive producer of an intellectual property work, such as a movie. I mean, how did that happen? And was that a sort of tortuous path? <laughs> to be honest, it wasn't something that I got into. I was conscious, mm. but I did not expect it to be that difficult. When we started talking about, the, about making the film, must be 2008, um, I was in the middle of a billion dollar fundraise um, for, a, for a large Nigerian company. Mm. Um, so I thought, I mean, a billion dollars, and they were trying to raise, at the time, it was $12 million, so mm. it was a budget for half of the Yellow Sun. It just, uh, $12 million doesn't seem like enough to distract me from my day job. Um, but out of, you know, for a variety of reasons anyway, I got drawn into it. Mm. Um, I, I then felt challenged by the prospect of attracting formal capital to something I, first of all, it's a story that's, uh, that I quite like. Mm. It's an authentically Nigerian story. It's an important part of Nigeria's history. Um, that's the context in which the story is set. But at the end of the day, it's a love story. Mm. Um, and I thought I could, I wondered whether I could use my skills in investment banking to translate to supporting mm. um, this project that had no history and we hoped would have a you know, bright future. Um, I didn't know anything about filmmaking, so I actually spent a lot of my evenings, weekends, um, holidays learning about filmmaking. Um, going for courses in different parts of the world mm. to understand how it was different I from the imagine. traditional fundraise. But it was fascinating stuff. It was but, but then I suppose the, the thing about it, um, and I'm sure by now, obviously you've gained insight and hindsight and foresight into it, but filmmaking is a business, isn't it? I mean, you know, it needs to be thought of that way for it to be profitable. And, and to that extent, it needs people like you. Um, filmmaking is indeed a business, but mm. it's operating an ecosystem. And it works if all aspects of the ecosystem or the value chain work. Mm. In many ways, Half of the Yellow Sun was ahead of its time. It was a Nigerian story, you know, with a lot of Nigerian content in the making. But it was a story that we hoped would translate beyond Nigeria. Mm. So all aspects of it, the production values, um, the cast, the crew, you know, reflected mm. A joint venture, if you like, approach between Nigeria and the UK. Um, obviously, since then, many similar, you know, many similar ventures have been successful in Nigeria. But in my view, commercial value can only be truly achieved when the value chain is fully developed. Right. No, absolutely. And it is always about, you know, show me the Benjamins, the money coming back. Right. You know, that chain about yeah, how absolutely. the money comes back. But, but I mean, presumably, you had to put together some sort of a prospectus so that investors would see the movie as a worthy transaction. Um, wh what did you put in that investment prospectus? Um, so, technically, mm. it was a placement memorandum. The term prospectus is generally used with public offerings. Right. I'm just, I'm just being technical. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, excuse me. <laughs> um, so, yes, we had to put together an information memorandum that mm. spoke to the financial aspect. But I wasn't trying to sell it only as a 
commercial venture. Right. It was a commercial and cultural venture. Right. Um, so you were trying to convince the investors that just in case you don't make your money back, think of it as a cultural investment. So I put it first as a cultural, right. as a cultural piece, but also gave examples of you know, a handful of similar projects mm. that have done well. Nobody could guarantee what half of the Yellow Sun would do, but we hoped mm. that it would do well. Commercially, it actually was, I mean, commercially, I am almost embarrassed by how poorly it did. Um, how but poorly it, did it do? Um, you know, it, uh, it faced some challenges that we did not anticipate. Mm. What were those challenges? The first one related, you know, essentially to the pushback from government. So the plans for distribution at the time were scheduled such that it would, it first released in Australia and New Zealand, mm. and it was deliberate, deliberately sort of far away, um, but to set the tone, and that it would then, then the release would happen in Nigeria before the Western mm. um, world, in the hope that the, the noise, if you like, um, from the Nigerian release would then help fuel mm. um, commercial returns from the rest of the world. But the Nigerian release was delayed because the Nigerian film and video... Yeah, um, you had a problem board. with censorship, didn't yes, you? Yes, yeah. yes. They had some challenges with some aspects of it. Um, when, now I work for government, I understand better. When government agencies use security as the reason for stopping something, it's a little bit difficult to argue against. And it took... 12 weeks of engagement with them to get to a point where we took out a few seconds of audio. Um, you know, I think we took out six seconds of audio um, from the film um, and then they were happy to release it. But we had lost the momentum yes, because of the, course. the release was scheduled to happen in sequence. So when Nigeria missed its own um, bit. Right, it went that had on, an effect. Yes, it went okay. on to the other Just markets. stay with us. We'll come right back and keep talking about this. You're watching the Arise interview, plenty more to the head, as we continue our chat with Yewande Sadiku, executive producer of Half of a Yellow Sun and executive secretary and CEO of the Nigerian Investment Promotion Commission. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Charles Anyagolo. Now, my guest today, Yewande Sadiku, has a career profile that is as attractive as it is intimidating. She is the executive producer of the film Half of the Yellow Sun, adapted from Chimamande Ngozi Adichie's superbly crafted award-winning book of the same name. Ms. Sadiku is, of course, better known as an investment banker who headed the investment banking department of Stambik IBTC Bank for many years and who is currently the executive secretary and CEO of the Nigerian Investment Promotion Commission. But between 2011 and 2014, she brought her considerable investment banking skills to bear in raising $10 million to make the film Half of a Yellow Sun. Now, by Hollywood standards, that amount is peanuts and would be considered low budget. But by Nigerian and African standards, $10 million is a heck of a lot of money, and it took the tenacity and genius of Miss Sadiku to pull it off. Most of the money was almost entirely raised in Nigeria, but what a challenge that must have been. Nothing will happen to you. I know nothing will happen to me. I just really want you to marry me. We should marry. Half of the Yellow Sun is a different kind of Nigerian film. Um, most Nigerian films have been made largely for a Nigerian audience or for a Nigerian in diaspora audience. And those films have translated to Africans and Africans in diaspora. I think Half of the Yellow Sun is one of a growing number of new Nigerian cinema, you know, that's made for a global audience. So it's very different in budget. It's very different in technical quality. It's very different in production values from many of the films that have come before. Financing and distribution were the two biggest challenges. 
without the ability and capacity to protect the intellectual property we have the, to the film and without knowing that we have the right as we deem fit to, en to exploit the film for whether it's commercial, whether it's cultural, um, for whatever perspective, I think it had been difficult to raise funding for this film. So I think that this film would not exist if we did not feel comfortable that our rights to the film were protected. And of course, uh, Yewande Sadiku, executive producer of Half of a Yellow Sun and current executive secretary and CEO of the Nigerian Investment Promotion Commission is still with me in the studio. We will, of course, talk about your work at the NIPC. I would like that. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you would. But, but I mean, let's get the movie out of the way because there's a lot of people who are very interested in the things that you have to say, not just because you made such a major film historically but also in, ter uh, in terms of uh, an investment um, but because there, there's a lot, of, a lot to learn from, from hearing you talk about it. I mean was it easier for you raising money for Half of the Yellow Sun as an investment banker um, because to a large extent you understand what investors are looking for don't you? Um, I don't think I would have been able to attempt it without my investment banking certainly skills. not that amount of money no certainly not that amount of money mm. so even if you pitch as a cultural uh, project it is still i mean it would, the, the funds that were given were not grants we could not guarantee its return mm. but the engagements that we had with investors were commercial um the the thing about the film industry um and the funding they require mm. a lot of the funding will be beyond the capacity of those who understand the craft. I always consider it as an industry that from a financial perspective is under advised. Mm. You know, they need professional advice to raise right funding, but they actually cannot afford the right quality of professional advice. Um, but because Half of the Yellow Sun was a passion project, mm. um, I had a full time job um, um, this was in many ways an evening and weekend hobby, uh, but because I had the skills, I could apply it. Mm. It'd be, it'd be, it'd be, it'd be, it would have been, you know, near impossible to do it without my investment banking background. So, in, in terms of the returns, which of course is the bottom line that, that you made on your ten million dollar budget, I mean, what did you say to investors when it became apparent that they weren't going to make tons of money from it? There, there's actually a tale in relation to that project that I still need to close. Right. But it was when I when I hear half of Yellow Sun being talked about the film being talked about mm. as a success, there's there's a little bit of a pool, you know, in my heartstrings, um, because in many ways it from a financial perspective it failed you mm. know that's the that's the modest way to put it um the expectations about financial returns about its financial performance the expectations about what um advertising would cost that we had made the projections about how it would be sold mm. were very different from how the reality played out and we did not have the budget you know to carry on what was required um, it was only, it was only beca because of the way we had planned to, to sell it, it was only after mm -hmm. that didn't materialize that we realized that there was simply no way that right. we could put the right marketing budget behind the film. Perhaps putting you know, more money behind uh, P&A for the film would have helped the financial return but it would also have me meant that more money was going. Mm. Was going and I think the, the biggest challenge is always that a lot of people um, concentrate on making the film, but the, you've got a budget, almost an equal amount of money for marketing the film, isn't it? And, if and, not more. And if trying to put more. it out there, absolutely. And that's always the problem. You make a great, because I mean, the film was brilliant. I watched it. Thank I was you. actually at the premiere in London. Because oh. I know B.E. Bandele, ah. I know Chiwatele Jofo. Mm -hmm. I, I interviewed all of them okay. during that, um, that premiere. I was there in Leicester Square exactly. uh, when, when it happened. Um, but people always forget that you've got to put a lot of money into the marketing of the film. 
uh, the expectation, I mean, we, we had gone to Cannes um, three years before it was made, two years before it was mm. made. The expectation was that once we had a product, we could, you know, get somebody to take basically. it off our hands right. in Cannes without having to go through Absolutely. Cannes or one of the other festivals, without having to go through the pain mm. of waiting for the funds to, um, to roll in. Um, and when the dust settled, I mean, my, my husband and I were left with a mm. material financial obligation. Yes, I can imagine. You know, that we still, you know, that it we was actually published, the book was published by your husband, wasn't it? Yes, the book was right. published in Nigeria right. by Kachifo. Sure. Yeah. Extraordinary. And, and, and was that what made you get into it? I mean, uh, are you still asking yourself loads of times, why on earth did I get involved with this? Um, I, so that wasn't what got me involved in it. Mm. It was, I mean, I, <laughs> if I tell you the story of how I got involved in it. Uh, Briefly, because we've got about a minute before <laughs> we have to take a break. So it was my competitive spirit that got me involved. In it. <laughs> I like that. Hey, I've jumped out of an airplane. <laughs> I've climbed Kilimanjaro. I might as well make a movie. <laughs> it, was, it was simply my competitive spirit. I mean, if, if competition can do this, why can't I? Mm. You know, that's, that's what got but me involved. But that's the spirit, it. isn't it? That's what changes the world. Yeah, but that's also what gets people killed, gets necks cut off. <laughs> well, your neck is, hasn't been cut off yet, has it? In fact, far from it, you're now the, 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 the head of the... In fact, you're in charge of investment coming into this country. Another challenging job. I can imagine. And I can absolutely... We're going to talk about that when we come back from a break. But, I mean, I have to say it's absolutely fascinating talking with you. Um, would you go into making another movie, having ex the experience you had? I have acquired a lot of knowledge from the many mistakes, mm. you know. And that's what made. it is, isn't it? A learning experience. Yes. But a learning experience with $10 million in tow. Yes. But I think that experience in... I actually believe completely in the potential of Nigeria's entertainment industry. Mm. And, I, and I speak as a cold capitalist about mm. what is possible from it. Um, I, it is, it is, it is an industry I would very much like to okay. play in again. Well, let's let's come back and talk about your investment, well, the way you work with the NIPC. You're watching the Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead as we continue our chat with Yewande Sadiku, executive producer of Half of a Yellow Sun and executive secretary and CEO of the Nigerian Investment Promotion Commission. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview, where we speak to the newsmakers as well as ordinary people doing extraordinary things around the world and featuring the voices at the heart of the stories. I'm Charles Anya Kolu. Now, my guest today, Yewande Sadiku, is the executive producer of the movie adaptation of the novel Half of a Yellow Sun. She raised $10 million to make that movie, but that was between 2008 and 2013 when the film was released. Today, Ms. Sadiku is the executive secretary and CEO of the Nigerian Investment Promotion Commission, and it is her responsibility to attract investment to Nigeria. Foreign investors have always been interested in this country. The reinstitution of democracy in 1999, along with the introduction of various economic reforms, boosted foreign direct investment in Nigeria. And by 2008, FDI had risen to $8 billion. In the decade leading up to 2014, Nigeria consistently ranked among the top three destinations for FDI in Africa. However, the reverse has been the case in more recent years. According to the EY Africa Attractiveness Index, an index which measures foreign direct investment attractiveness of African countries, Nigeria now ranks 17th on the continent. So what's responsible for this drastic change in Nigeria's FDI fortunes? So I'll start with perceptions because sometimes Challenges in business environments are realities, and other times they're a function simply of perception. I thought I'd share this slide. Um, and this was a study done by EY. They found from speaking across the continent to investors who are both present and absent, that for investors who are present on the continent, they consider it to be the most attractive investment destination. 
those who have tried it, who have tasted it. But those who have not been to the continent, who are not established on the continent, consider it to be the second least attractive investment destination in the world. It tells me that those who have found a way, and I use the words find a way deliberately, because every market is different and you have to find a way to operate in that market. But those who have found a way to operate on the African continent find that it is a useful proposition, it's a useful venture that they have made, whereas those who have not been tend, I suppose, to believe what they read in the press. What's interesting is whether you are present and therefore an optimist, or absent and therefore a pessimist, is that both groups believe that the attractiveness has improved in the last year and is expected to improve in the future. Well, has it? Yewande Sadiku is the executive producer of Half of a Yellow Sun and current executive secretary and CEO of the Nigerian Investment Promotion Commission, and she's still with me in the studio. Thank you ever so much for staying with us. Um, where would you say that Nigeria is with foreign investment at the moment? Has it got better since the Buhari government took over or worse? Um, <clears throat> interest remains. Uh, it's conversion that has been difficult. Um, and In other words, converting it into investment. Yes. So we, at NIPC, we track investment interest. But that is completely different from actual investments that come in. But they give us a sense of whether investors are looking or not. Mm. Um, and the usual things that investors, that bring investors to a market, of the principal things, the size of the Nigerian market, the availability of the labor force, um, the fact that our labor force is, the, the age of our population, uh, so the demographics in many ways mm. are very favorable for investments. Those things work in Nigeria's favor. But the returns, um, and, I'm, and I'm speaking first generally now. Sure, of course. Um, but the challenges that investors have, increasingly now, you know, you watch the news, the challenges with security, investors listen to those things. The market remains attractive, but government policies need to remain sufficiently stable mm. for the tenure of an investor's participation, particularly for direct investors who don't have the capacity to flip Absolutely. like portfolio investors yes. would. Yes, I'd like to talk about that portfolio thing in a minute, but I mean, FDI in Nigeria contracted from $2.3 billion in 2014 to 1 billion in 2016, just before you came in. Um, and has subsequently tumbled since that time, partly because, because beyond things like security and so on, um, the MTN repatriation scandal, from what I understand, had a big impact on investor confidence, and the backlog of taxes imposed on oil companies as well. Um, that increased the perceived risk and uncertainty surrounding the Nigerian business environment and so FDI to total investment flows has dropped from 20% in 2016 to 4% in 2019. That's pretty drastic, isn't it? Yes. The, um, the FDI levels are in many ways not representative of what Nigeria needs. Mm. Um, but in the years when Nigeria attracted FDI, it wasn't actually business as usual events that attracted the FDI. In the years when Nigeria attracted the most FDI was government policies that changed the dial mm. in terms of economic, in terms of reforms um, in sectors that moved the needle. So when we sold the telco licenses, when we sold oil and gas assets to indigenous companies, when you know the banking consolidation happened, mm. um, those show up on an FDI chart as spikes so we need similarly groundbreaking sector reforms that attract investments. Interestingly, when the oil and gas, sorry, when the um, power reforms happened mm. and the oil and gas ass and, and the power assets were sold, when the Gencos and the Discos were sold, we don't see a spike in those years um, on the FDI chart. Right. 
um, because of the way it was structured, um, a lot of the deals were, had Nigerian participation with not as much foreign capital coming in. But it is government policy, in my view, that really drives um, FDI attraction. So you think the policy of this government is off the mark then? I think, it's, I wouldn't say the policy of this government. There's a lot of continuity in this government from the policies that existed before. Yeah, but the point is that the, the previous governments were raising a lot more foreign direct investment than this government. But remember, investment flow takes a while. You know, you don't make... It takes a while to craft a policy. It takes a while for capital to follow it. Yeah, but you've had companies leaving Nigeria in that period. In other words, people who were already invested, people who you'd already captured, have been leaving the country. Like? Well, quite a number of the oil companies have gone. Quite a number of, a lot of other companies have left this these shores? Um, in, if I, I mean, for the oil sector, the delay in the passage of the PIB, mm. the expectation about what, what shape it would take, when it would come in and the like, um, affected their interest. I believe with the imminent, because the discussions on the PIB have been very engaging. Mm. Um, I expect the process will be completed this time. Um, <coughs> and I'm hoping that it will be, that the law will be bedded in a way that meets government's aspirations for the development of the sector. But how challenging but allows, is it? Sorry, finish what you're saying. But allows the operators, the mm. investors who will invest to meet their own um, profit you know, and capital aspirations. But how challenging is it for you? Because I mean, obviously you're somebody who is used to the private sector. I mean, you know, you do things, you move, the money moves and things are happening. And, you know, we can see that from your background and your history, extremely dynamic, when you, you have to find yourself sort of waiting, twiddling your thumbs while you're waiting for decisions to be made. Because that PIB bill, you could, you could argue, yes, it didn't start with this government, mm. but it's just dragged on for years. But the reality of government is that it moves at a completely different pace. Well, this government moves All at a completely government. different pace. All governments move at a completely different pace. But well, you have to admit sector. that this is particularly slow. I'm not sure that this is particularly slow. Well, let, let's not get but into an say, argument about <laughs> But about I would say that which, government is Yeah, generally. governments generally, mm. they, they have bureaucracies, mm. but some are worse than others. Now, it's interesting, though, that while FDI foreign direct investment has been falling. You mentioned this briefly earlier. Foreign portfolio investment in Nigeria has been rising. In 2016, portfolio investments were 35% of total investments, but by the end of 2019, it had hit 68%, which is a dramatic increase from $1.8 billion to $16.4 billion. Extraordinary, isn't it? So uh, the portfolio reflects, the portfolio investors' performance reflects the performance of the Nigerian Stock Exchange. Mm. Um, and the resolution of the creation of the investors and exporters FX window in 2017, in the middle of 2017, helped materially move portfolio flows for the rest of 2017 and in 2018. Um, <coughs> um, but we, we actually need a better connection in terms of investment um, strategy mm. between the long end, um, which is direct investment, and the short end, which is portfolio investment. Because, of course, FPI is viewed less favorably than FDI, isn't it? I mean, because portfolio investments can be sold off quickly and are seen as sort of short-term attempts to make money rather than a long-term investment in the economy, which is what FDI represents. You know, I find many people say that, and I don't agree. Right. Why do you disagree? Um, it, is a, it is a journey. When investors invest, I mean, it's the same way investments will generally start with trade mm. before you get to somebody actually making an investment. For many people, they'll, they'll come in as portfolio investors until they get comfortable with the market. The more comfortable they get with the market, the more likely they will play at the longer end. Okay, I see what you they're mean. They're already in so the they're market. they're testing the water. They already have approval mm. for that country. They're comfortable with the country risk. Then they'll go into the longer end of the market. And for direct investors, the reason many 
should be comfortable with investing long term is that if they needed to get out for whatever reason, mm. the portfolio market is available to take them out. And right. portfolio market only exists because somebody invested at the direct end you know, previously. So I see them as part of a continuum. I hear many people say that portfolio investors you know, are short term, they flip in and out. The way I look at it, if you look at a, if you look at a matchstick, mm. it's very easy to break one. If you put a billion matchsticks together, they would look like a complete pipe. Mm, no, absolutely. And it's the same, you know, perspective that I think we should take of portfolio. But I would not. I don't think it is correct um, when we're talking about investment generation mm. that you know that people should be as dismissive as I find that many people can be. Yeah, that makes sense. What you're saying. What are some of the things that you brought in to the NIPC to make investing in Nigeria much more attractive to investors since you took over in 2016? So the job I've had to do in NIPC is, uh, you know, tough one. Um, I can imagine. I, I came from a background where there were, uh, you know, I worked for institutions mm. that had fairly well-framed structures. Governance and compliance were mm. a very big deal. So apart from the external work of, you know, generating um, investment interest. There was also the internal work of building the organization. And the analogy I like to use, um, when I look at Nigeria's potential, and the longer I've stayed in the job, the more, the more I am humbled by what is possible mm. in Nigeria. The more I look at Nigeria across all the 36 states, the, the more I see the potential that's possible. Now, um, if, so, I, so I see Nigeria's investment as ambition as building a skyscraper. Now to build a skyscraper, you first need to build a foundation Absolutely. that can support the skyscraper, even if you cannot afford the skyscraper yet. So you build you know, an appropriate foundation. So a lot of the work I've done in NIPC is actually, if you like, below the surface. It's right. capacity so building and the like. So the effect will be seen in years to come. That's what I believe. Okay, stay yeah. with us. You're watching the Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead as we continue our chat with Yewande Sadiku, executive producer of Half of the Yellow Sun and executive secretary and CEO of the Nigerian Investment Promotion Commission. Stay with us. back to the Arise interview. I'm Charles Anyagolu. Now, my guest today, Yewande Sadiku, is an investment banker and executive secretary and CEO of the Nigerian Investment Promotion Commission, or NIPC, which is this country's official investment promotion agency. For many years, she was the executive director overseeing corporate and investment banking at Stanbic IBTC Bank and later leveraged her investment background to raise funding for the $10 million film adaptation of Chimamande Ngozi Adichie's best-selling novel, Half of the Yellow Sun. But who is Yewande Sadiku and where does she come from? Well, according to Google, she spent her early years in Zaria, northern Nigeria, but grew up in Lagos, where she attended secondary school. She subsequently completed her first degree, a Bachelor of Science in Industrial Chemistry from the University of Benin, and would go on to obtain an MBA degree from the University of Warwick in the UK. And Yoande Sadiku, executive producer of Half of the Yellow Sun and current executive secretary and CEO of the Nigerian Investment Promotion Commission is still with me in the studio. Thank you for staying with us. How did you go from chemistry to investment banking? <laughs> I went through commercial banking in between. Okay. I was in my final year in the university. I uh, accompanied a roommate to sit for a bank's qualifying exam. Um, while waiting for her to finish, I thought, you know, why not just try it? Mm. Um, and that's how I ended up at Citibank. I was one of six people from the University of Benin that they recruited from the university. So my getting into banking was accidental. Um, I liked, you know, my two years at Citibank. You like number crunching, do you? I just liked the tempo of the work. Um, I then got an MBA from Warwick mm. and joined IBTC in what was then IBTC in January 1996. And I stayed there until the 31st of October 2016, when I left to take my current job. So almost 21 years in the same organization. Extraordinary. 
And, and in terms of your background, um, where you grew up, and you, 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 you were in Zaria, is that where you were born? Yes. Zaria is northern Nigeria. Zaria is in Kaduna State. Right. I'm always very proud to stay in my... I mean, do you speak Hausa or anything? Sadly not. I had hoped that in my time, Hausa was the first language I learned. Sure. Um, but in all my years in Lagos, some, somewhere along the line, I, I lost it. My parents actually, fascinatingly, still speak Hausa. When they, gossip, when they want to gossip at home so their children don't hear, they gossip, <laughs> they gossip in Hausa. I like that. <laughs> and, and I mean, what was, your, what was your family doing in Zaria? My father um, was a banker, so mm. he worked all over Nigeria. Okay, so banking is in your blood, then, um, well, to some extent. Well, I don't know whether it's in my blood. I'm a Jebu. You right. know, they say when you're a Jebu, there's some consciousness of right. money and right. how it works. Somebody sh rattles something <laughs> in your, your that ear. That's in your blood, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> You'll wake up, will you? <laughs> and, um, I mean, you, you, you then, obviously, you, you, you got into banking and you stayed in the same organization. Mm -hmm. How did you make that transition from private banking, I an mean investment banker, to the NIPC? Some of the skills I, I continue to need in NIPC were very easy to translate you know, from investment banking. What was more difficult? I mean, if you think about the tools the access to resources mm. that an investment banker has in the public sector is materially different. So there's a fair degree of humility mm. you know, that you first have to live with when you come to the public sector. But I like the NIPC mandate, and I was challenged by it. And I yeah, and I found for you, challenge is important, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> because I was going to say that, I mean, I, I'm just wondering why a successful investment banker, I mean, you would have, you know, made loads more money, although that's not always just the criteria, um, than going into government. And, and you would have found, I mean, did, did you kind of do your research going into that place to say, can I actually cope with this? Or did you just say, hey, I'll go, whatever the circumstances, I'll take up the challenge? So I'm not sure, I'll tell you a story that you may mm. not have heard before. I was on a pilgrimage. I was in a walking pilgrimage. It's called the Camino de Santiago, a medieval Catholic okay, right. pilgrimage yes, trail. Yes. But I'm a Muslim. Right. I walked 320. So what were you doing in a Catholic It was pilgrimage. a pilgrimage. Right. It was, you know, it was first about the spiritual journey. Right. I walked 322 kilometers in 12 days. My goodness. And it was on day four of that 12-day journey that my appointment to this role was announced. I wasn't expecting it. Um, Did you apply for it, or were, were you expecting to be... No, it was a... You just came out of the blue, It you? was a complete surprise. Wow. Um, so I was on, on... That's a vote of confidence, though, isn't it? I, I mean, it is very flattering mm. when your country calls you Absolutely. to help. I mean, they call to serve. Um, if I hadn't been on a pilgrimage, I might have looked at it differently, but I spent the last eight days of my pilgrimage reflecting on it. And... Everything that I experienced on that pilgrimage suggested that the, uh, the right call to make, the only call to make, mm. was to accept the appointment, despite the emotional, financial, and what I consider a huge, um, there's a spiritual cost to it too. <laughs> I <get him. laughs> There's a spiritual I cost like to that. it too. Um, <laughs> you, see, you just find your spirit draining away, do you? You find strength you did not know that right. you had. You know who you are, mm. but even better. I mean, the opportunity to, I remember saying to somebody in the first few months of mm. joining NIPC that I've gone from um, waiting to hear what the policy will be to sitting behind the scenes and having a conversation about what it should be. Mm. I mean, th there's something about it that is very um, Yeah, I see what powerful. you mean. Yeah. Um, but also the, you know, the more, the more you know Nigeria, mm. and from the position I sit in, the more you know what is possible in Nigeria. But do you actually get the chance to do a lot of your work? Because from people who've been in government, I often hear of them spending a lot of time fending off people who are trying to sort of pull them down or do this, that, or the other thing, sort of thing. So, so I've come to find that the reality of working for government mm. is that that is part of the work. For some people, that is all of the work. Mm. So, but you get an opportunity to do work if you want to do work. Um, and I got an opportunity to get a feel for Nigeria's wealth. Um, and the more 
I, the longer I have spent in government, the more fascinated I am about closing that gap between where Nigeria should be and where we are today. But do you find that you're constantly undermined by other branches of government? Because, for example, if you're trying to attract investors and the visa regime makes it tortuously impossible for somebody to actually get in and get out at short notice, if you've got to worry about what the customs people are doing and what this, all the other things, the allied sort of functions that should make your job easier are getting in the way. Um, well, I mean, first, it's customs is actually not the biggest problem that we have. No, I'm just giving an example. Yes, I know, yeah. but it's I, d I don't I don't I don't want to I don't. It's uh, given how supportive, I'm um, sorry, immigration is not uh, is right, generally not a problem. Right, yeah. uh, given how supportive immigration is, um, I don't know whether that's a good example to use in the context of the challenges. But I don't really see it as being. There isn't enough of a joining up in government they're a fair number of silos right. it happens in the private sector too but it is even more important in government that we are better joined up mm. but the administrative burden of working in government is such that the volume of paperwork and everything is paper and based on the provisions of both nigerian law and the financial regulations the person who is chief executive and therefore the accounting officer has a disproportionate burden of responsibility. Mm. Even when you can delegate, there's still a lot of paperwork that only has your name on it. There are letters that only you can sign because of the rules in the public sector about how letters are signed to senior people in government. So there, the, I well mean, that I'll takes a lot of time. It does, it yeah. certainly, it certainly or does. Perhaps I should say that wastes a lot of time. It is the work, you know. It, it is, whether you see it as waste or take, it is the work. You cannot do the work without doing it. Mm. And every day I continue to learn how to do it better. I'd say I've got a lot wiser from the many mistakes I've made about, you right. know, how not to do and it. And you've got about a, a year to go in this term. Do you want to see it renewed? I've got nine months and 13 days to go. In You've been counting term. the days, have you? <laughs> <laughs> it's a five-year term. I well, mean, I would like you to stay, and I hope you do. Yewande Sadiku, I want to thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much thank for Thank you for coming me. in. Thank you. That's it for this edition of The Arise Interview. Join us again tomorrow from me and the entire team here in Abuja. Bye-bye, and thank you for watching.